and happy Sabbath. Today is a very exciting day. Today we got the last lesson of our, of, our, of our study guide about knowing and interpreting the Word of God. I gotta say this was a much needed lesson that we had. Um, many people read the Word of God, but to interpret the Word of God I, I think that's what causes so many divisions and so many different denominations in our church. And so as, as we wrap up this, uh, in Lesson 13, Living by the Word of God, I want to first invite God's presence in our conversation. So let us have a, a quick word of prayer. Uh, Lord our Father, we want to be able to interpret your Word thoroughly and correctly as you have intended us to interpret it. Lord, be with us in a special way. Open our minds, open our hearts, and open our eyes. And Lord, for those who are watching, open our ears and, and open my ears too, Lord. Make sure that uh, I learn from this lesson as well as everybody else does. May you be in control. May you get the honor and glory, and may you be the center of our conversation. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So I, want, I just want to review real fast. I got my computer before me because I have multiple windows open, and so I like having resources at my hands. That's one thing. Um, as, as, as a studier of the Bible, I love my resources, and that's to make sure that I'm very accurate on what I'm trying to say. But with this quarterly we had, we, had, we started off with the uni uniqueness of the Bible, the origin and nature of the Bible was second week, Jesus and the Apostles' view of the Bible, the Bible, the authoritative source of our theology, Bible by Scripture alone, or sola scriptura, why is interpretation needed in the Bible, languages, text, and context, then we had two on, on creation with Genesis, then the Bible as history, which was an awesome lesson, the Bible as prophecy, dealing with difficult passages, and now today we have living by the Word of God. Now, I want to tell you, the previous 12 lessons are nothing. It's absolutely nothing without this last lesson. We can know everything, but unless we attach it to an action in our life, and we're going to find out today not just any kind of action, but with an intentional action. If we don't do that, it's nothing. It's no good. This, this Bible and everything that's within it is useless to a person holding it unless the person holding it makes it a part of their life. And so today we're going to talk about living the Word of God. And so um, the, the, the memory text for today is from James chapter 1, verse 22. And the Word of God says, But be doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. I think that there's no truer statement. Um, we need to have not only the ability to read, understand, and interpret, but also to follow. When Jesus came to the earth, he spent the first 30 some years with his mom being trained in Scripture. It's pretty evident. When he went to the temple, he was able to conversate with the temple leaders. And yes, we know he's the son of God, but it also shows that his mother was bringing him up daily in Scripture, and he was not only reading it, but he was memorizing it and putting it within his heart. And he was able to use it and apply it to those teachers and ask detailed questions, which they were not used to hearing. And he had answers, which they were not used to hearing as well. And so this is just an example for our youth that it's not too young to live the Word of God. Whether you're young, middle-aged, or older, we are all responsible for not only reading, but to do. Amen? And then in Sunday's uh, Sabbath lesson, it says, What is true for education is also, or what is true for education in general also is true for studying the Bible in particular. Now, uh, my assistant today who will be doing the Bible study with me is Dr. Arthur Schwartz. He's, he'll be here in a few moments. 
but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull his file while he's not here. Because I can do that. If he was here to protect himself, that would be one thing, but he's not, so I'm going to use this as an opportunity. He was my biology teacher, and he teaches A&P and sciences over at Southwestern Adventist University. He's a great professor by all standards, but he's a difficult professor by many standards. And so when I was taking his class, um, to learn the material, there, there's many ways to learn material. Um, we can read it and study in a book. And I, I'm, a pretty good at, I'm pretty good at underlining and highlighting and taking notes out of a book. And I'm probably that's the best way for me to learn. But some people are auto learners. They, they learn by audio. And they, they hear a lecture and they receive majority of the information from the lecture. And they might learn a lot from that lecture. But I will tell you right now that everybody in that class was not doing good. In fact, everybody in that class was doing really, really bad. We were struggling. The first test was, was a rude awakening that many of us very well might not pass unless we got our act together. And so the classmates began weeping and gnashing their teeth. And so I made the idea I will be a tutor for the class. Now, I was no smarter than nobody else. But I'm going to tell you a secret that I learned early on in high school and as an uh, early uh, college student, that if you teach something, you'll retain it so much more. And so next quarterly is called Making Friends for God. And so all these lessons that we're learning this time should be applied when we're making friends for God. Use the interpretation of the Bible. Use your knowledge. Use your active faith and make friends and teach them what you know because when you teach somebody what you know it becomes ingrained in your mind and in your heart you're able to memorize a lot better you're able to retain the information a lot better because of me being a tutor and training I got an A in this class which is abnormal but not just that though many of the students became teachers too and many of them got really great grades as well so the lesson for the story is that we should not only read the Word of God. We should not only try to memorize the Word of God, but we should also try to teach those close to us the Word of God, whether they're our children, our friends, our fathers and mothers. It doesn't matter. I have a Bible study going on right now with my papa. My dad and me are going through the amazing facts. And so that is an amazing thing. But guess what? I'm learning the Bible even more thoroughly by teaching my dad about the Bible. So I want to encourage each of you this week to go ahead and find somebody you can teach and start a Bible study with them. You'll be surprised how much more you retain. It continues on saying in, in Saturday's lesson, if we are not willing to abide by the Word of God and are not willing to practice what we have studied, we will not grow. And so I hear this, it comes to my office often, Pastor, my Christian walk is stagnant. I, I don't have that fire I once did. I'm, I'm not moving anywhere. And I say, okay, well, what's your devotion like? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? And we're going to talk about that too. And they, they, they tell me, well, I start off reading Psalms and Proverbs. I'm like, oh, that's a great start. What's the next thing you do? I go to work. Okay. And then what? I come home, I cook food, and I go to bed. I'm like, where in this are you spending more time using your... What do you do at work to use the Word of God? What do you mean? I, how do I use the Word of God at work? And so we, we start explaining how to give testimony. We start explaining about how to just living through your life. Everything you do, what you eat, what you drink, what you say, and what you do with your hands, by the glory of God. And by doing that, everything becomes a testimony. Everything you do, your mind starts focusing on God. And your Christian life wakes up. And it becomes stronger and stronger. And then your life is back where you want to be. That fire first love is back in your heart. And so if your Christian walk is stagnant, if it's not as active as you once thought it was or could be, or where it should be, Put God's Word into action in your everyday life. I want to go to Sunday's lesson real fast. It says, The living Word of God 
and the Holy Spirit. And this is most important because we, we can really be misguided unless we use the Holy Spirit to assist us in interpretation. There is nothing good in humanity. Nothing good. Only God working in us can we have good in us. If we try to work on our own, that's when we could bend the scriptures to, 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 to appeal to our own needs. I, I, I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit, but we're going to come back to it. Jesus was in the wilderness, right? And in the wilderness, at the end of that fasting he did in, in the wilderness, the devil came and approached him. It's, it's, it's going to be found in Matthew, uh, let's see, uh, Luke 4, 4, 4, 8, and 4, 10 through 12. Um, the devil comes to him and says, If you are the Son of God, make this stone bread, right? Tempts him. And how does, how does Jesus rebuttal that? It is written, right? And then he quotes scripture. Oh, second time he says, oh, okay, well, um, tell you what. Um, jump off the pinnacle of this temple and the angels will save you from dashing your foot upon the ground. Now that's the devil reading scripture. How did Jesus rebuttal? It is written. But what's the difference between the two of these? One, he was using scripture to defend himself. And the second one, he was correcting the context of the scripture. See, the devil knows this Bible inside and out too. He's memorized it, I'm sure. And because he's memorized it, he can read it and use it, scripture by scripture, but he can use it out of context. And he can deceive us by using it out of context. The only way that we're going to keep it in context is by the unction of the Holy Spirit. So by having the Holy Spirit in us, we can say we feel joy in our heart when we're doing good and guilt in our heart when we're doing bad. The same thing when interpreting the scripture, when it feels good about what we're doing and how we're living, then we know the Holy Spirit's in the equation. But when we're, 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 we're reading scripture to exalt self, that's a very dangerous place to be. Welcome, author. I was using your name kind of in vain, not quite empty, Elias, but I, I was using your name earlier. I discussed our biology class that we had and how I studied and uh, how I, I started a tutoring class for the students and how we were all struggling through the uh, lessons you were giving us. And I never was late for biology class. No, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize deeply, but... Well, no, no, now that I have a professor here, I want to ask you, professor, because a professor is um, a studious on one thing. One thing major. They have many subjects, but professors know how to do one thing, and that is how to teach. They know how to get material from a book or from their thoughts into somebody else's head in the most proficient manner possible. And so I remember when we were uh, in your biology class, I didn't mention this earlier, but you used real life issues and real life situations to allow us to address the context of the book to our life, things that we will be facing, right? And, you were, and I, want, I want to see what other ways do you find to be the most effective ways to teach somebody a subject, I, I guess. Um, like, like we're gonna say scripture today, but any kind of subject. Well, um, and of course, no teacher is perfect. Of course. You know, I, I, well, I often talk about how Jesus, I think, was a perfect teacher. Um, however, not every teacher reaches every student, unfortunately. Um, D 
different teachers have different styles and people, students have different learning styles as well. And, um, you know, many years ago I had a class that was very unusual at a, at a community college a long ways from here. And the, there were four groups of students. They were all together for lecture, but each one of the four groups were in a different program and they had a different lab on, you know, the, the, uh, the lab for each group was on a different day. And I remember one was fish and wildlife students, another one was conservation students, and another one was, you know, there were, there were four different groups like that. And they had different characteristics, collective characteristics. And they learned in different ways. They were very, one group was very practical. They wanted to know, they wanted to do hands-on. They didn't want to listen to me. They wanted to just do it, you know? And they learned by doing. And another group hung on every word I said and wrote everything down, you know? But they have, there's different, people have different learning styles. I was uh, discussing earlier with the audio, like the audio learners and the reading learners, but yeah, there's also the practical learners, the hands-on learners, yeah. right? Um, but then I was saying, our first test, we, we all cried in your class. I think you, you heard the cries in, our, in, our, in the class, and a afterward, we were looking for answers, and that's when we started uh, the after hours studying and, and tutoring. And I, a, lot, a lot of students, in fact, uh, there's some students today that I still have relationships with because of that tutoring class. Wow. And so uh, we started tutoring, but because I was trying to teach it, I learned it, and that's really the only way I passed your class. And that by way. the way, he was a very good student. Oh, mercy. He had already taken a class like that, but for whatever reason, they didn't give you credit for that because it, it was too long ago or something? Yeah, it was a transfer of credits. Something oh. happened between my transfer of credits, but I had to anyway. take another human biology or a biology. Um, so we, 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 we know that learning is unique for each person. I love what Dr. Schwartz here said. Um, the teacher desires to reach every student, but not every student is reached. Hmm. And this is no different in Christianity. The, uh, as a pastor, trust me, I, when I preach a sermon, I, I'm teaching. I am. I'm teaching myself first, but I'm trying to teach everybody in front of me, and I, I pray I reach every single person, and that you get the message that that has been given to me. But unfortunately, the cold truth is some people are not reached. And I think even Jesus had this problem because the young rich ruler was no different. He tried to reach the young rich ruler and the young rich ruler ended up walking away. But, th but with learning and with being an active doer of the word of God, it's not only doing the action, but it's the intention of the action. And Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And this is why the Holy Spirit is needed in our studies, in our learning, in our, in our teaching, and in our actions. Because without the Holy Spirit, there is nothing good in humanity. We, we had that removed a long time ago. Only the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us is good. Um, so at the tail end of, what day is this? I do apologize. At, at the tail end of Sunday's lesson, it says, no one, in the last paragraph, no one is able to explain the scriptures without the aid of the Holy Spirit. But when you take up the word of God with a humble and teachable heart, the angels of God will be by your side to impress you with evidences of truth. And that comes from E.G. White Selected Messages, book one, page 411. Now, when I was saying this is, uh, well, I want to get to this is because there are students who are teachable, right? And there's, there's students who are absolutely not teachable. They have their own focus. They have their own agenda. They play on their games on their phone. I remember that was an issue we had. You, you were dealing with the cell phone problem in class. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, 
you know, what can I say about this? Um, I think everyone is teachable, but, you know, to get them to put away the cell phone so that I can teach them, that's, that's maybe the difficulty. Um, but, you know, this, this whole business of, of living by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, um, it, it sort of raises a question in my mind. You know, does, it, you know, elsewhere it says the Holy Spirit will guide us into truth. Mm -hmm. So the question I want to ask you or people in the audience, does, you know, what does that mean, guide us into truth? Mm -hmm. Does new, does new truth come from the Holy Spirit? That's a very good question. I will say, if it's tested by the scriptures, and upon line upon line, scripture upon scripture, if that truth is found to be truth, then yes, it has to come to the Holy well, Spirit. Well, then it might be new to the, the studier, yes. but it isn't new because it's uh, already in the scripture. Yes, okay, so okay. I, I, I want to perceive what you're saying, and he's absolutely right. There is no new, new scripture, but like Daniel says, at the end there'll be, you know, yeah. greater knowledge. And, and we'll understand right now. But right now, seal this book up, it says. But now that book is unsealed because our knowledge base has increased. And now those wars have passed and those, those kingdoms have come to pass. Now prophecy is in a rearview mirror in that picture instead of going forward. And so now we have that knowledge. Now we say, Jesus said beforehand, and now it is. So we can say that the Holy Spirit helps us to... To illuminate, illuminates a good the, word. The the uh, what's already in Scripture, but it isn't. You know, when when Christ came, it seems to me that he illuminated. Maybe I don't want to use that word again. No, that's a good he, word. He uh, he revealed new truths about the character of God. I think. Would would you agree? He he revealed new truths about the character of God because he was the embodiment of God. The Holy Spirit, however, I think has a different role, and that is to illuminate what we already should know. Amen. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus says, I am, uh, the, the scriptures say, I am a lamp unto their feet, a light unto their path. Yeah. You know, and, and he is. And this word illuminate is, is, is perfectly because he goes, I, the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Uh, many times, God's word is light. And Jesus himself says, I am the light. I am the life of all men. And so this, this word you're using is, is a perfect word, but how do we use that light is the question. And some people like to shine that light in other people's faces instead of at their feet. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to equate it to driving down the road. I have, this, I have photophobic eyes, which means my eyes are sensitive to light. And so driving at night, I, I will sometimes have uh, auto-dimming glasses on. And I know, I know I look weird with sunglasses at night, but... I wear auto dimming glasses because um, when somebody has their high beams on in front of me, it blinds me really bad. And so there's a use for high beams. If you have a trail of cars behind you and nobody in front of you and you're like in a dark woods, it's great. Throw your high beams on, they illuminate the horizon and the ground. But when somebody's coming towards you, just illuminate the ground. Turn off your high beams and you illuminate the ground and they can see farther in front of them. So correct use of light and especially in God's word, is essential. It's supposed to be a light to our feet and a light unto our path. And we're supposed to illuminate the path of those around us as well. But I perceive you're right that the Holy Spirit should bring truth that we already know in front of us. And as, as for a new Christian such as myself, I, I, I read the word and the Holy Spirit gives me understanding of the word. And I can do an iron sharpens iron with like a professor like yourself. And we can, we can, we can, reason with one another and talk about scripture with one another. I want to ask a question about Philippians chapter 2 verse 16. Oh yeah. It's at the end of Sunday's lesson and we are cooking on our time. Um, the word of God says, um, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. And this is a powerful verse. 
And um, I, I just want to see what your perspective, I, had, I did a study on this first, just to get a good understanding of what I was trying to say when they pointed it out. But what's your perception on holding fast? You know, I considered that question as well. Um, I didn't do a big study on it, but <laughs> but holding fast. You know, you you think of. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a in a small boat when the wind comes up, the storm comes up. Um, it can be kind of tense, mm -hmm. and you need to hold on to something that's solid. And sometimes uh, there's not very much that's solid when you're tossing around on a, on a, on a, on a boat. Um, I, I think, you know, now we're, our society seems to be entering kind of a stormy time. Mm, yes. um, you know, politically, you look at what's going on. Um, it seems kind of scary sometimes. It does. Uh, if you, you know, in the the uh, the disease outbreak that we're we're dealing with, also seems kind of troubling. You know, it's not going away, at least not in Texas. Um, that's very troubling to me as a biologist because I have at least a rudimentary understanding of epidemiology, and. The numbers aren't going down, folks. Uh, so that's, that, that's troubling. What do we hold fast to? Well, what is there to hold fast to mm. if it isn't our beliefs and our fundamental trust and faith in God? That's the only thing. You bring up an excellent point. I, I want to I highlight your point. We have, I want, I want, I want to use a boat. Can I use a boat? When the, um, when the disciples of Jesus were in the boat and the, and the wind stirred up, now they're sailors. But at that point in time, they, they, they were outside of their spectrum of sailing. And they were looking for something to hold on to. And the first thing they did was they turned around and they saw Jesus sleeping in the back, right? Um, so there's a point where human possibility goes away. And right now in our world, in our civilization, that's it's looking kind of going towards that direction with the sicknesses that can't be controlled. We, this ain't the first one. We had HIV virus that really took us by storm in the 80s. They, they, they had no cure for that. It was killing a lot of people. And now we have a, a new kind of coronavirus that's also killing a lot of people and it's very hard to contain. And there's these storms to the left to the right. And so the word holding fast in Greek, I'm going to be very slow here, is a petros. And, it, and it means um, literally to hold in front of you. Um, the reason why this is special is because the person who's saying it is not Greek. They're Hebrews. They're Jews. And so whenever you say, um, whenever you say in front of you, um, the Hebrews are very, uh, they're, they're very directional nomadic race. And so when you're, when you're talking to somebody face to face, you have given them your, your full attention. And it's called pe a pe. And um, so holding this in front of you means this has your entire focus. Now the word um, holding fast in this context is a, is a participle. I ain't going to go too far into that. But it's active. It's a continual word. So he's saying continue holding the Word of God directly in front of you, not worrying about what's to the left or what's to the right. If you do that, we can go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 4, which is on the tail end of that pink, and it says, uh, But you who held fast, same context, but you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. And so I agree with you, doctor, that with all these things going around, around us, on the sides of us, that it can be a very um, difficult time that we're having, but we hold firm. If we keep the focus of God in front of us, 
Deuteronomy says that we will be alive today, every one of us. Not necessarily physically, but definitely spiritually. Amen? You got a, a scripture verse you're going to? I was just getting prepared with the, if the topic came up, but uh, um, go on and maybe I'll jump in. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, so with living an active life, living, um, living the Word of God with the Holy Spirit, it definitely means in all aspects of our life. It's easy to live life when things are easy with God. But when things get challenging, like, jobs go away, finances get slim, it's a little more difficult sometimes. I, I tell people that's the moment that we should start praying more earnestly, making our devotions more applicable to our life. That's going to bring us to Monday's lesson, learning from Jesus. So we talked already a little bit about uh, when, Jesus says, uh, when Jesus was tempted by Satan right, in the wilderness. And every single time he responded to the, the devil was, it is written, it is written, it is written. Do you know why he kept referring to the word of God? Well, he knew the scriptures intimately. He did. And, you know, we have an amazing um, facility when we open our Bible and we have it everything divided up into chapter and verse. Mm. Nothing was like that in Jesus' day, except exactly. perhaps for Psalms. I think Psalms was divided up into chapters. But all of the chapters and verses came along later by later scholars. Uh, I don't remember the exact times, but the, the, the Bible was divided up into chapters centuries ago. But verses is fairly recent, mm -hmm. you know, within the last few hundred years. Um, so Jesus, you know, what, what strikes me is that Jesus really knew the scriptures. He spent quality time in scripture, right? And so he could find things. You know, you remember the time when he was asked to read in his hometown in, in the Bible. He opened the scroll. He found the place fairly quickly, I, I imagine. It doesn't, you know, and knew what he wanted to read and read it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I think, well, having the Bible divided up into chapter and verse is an advantage for finding those places, and you can easily jot those scriptures down, that knowing the Bible so thoroughly is something that we're missing out on when we have those, when we depend on chapter and verse. Amen. And yeah, our Bible's in codex right now. Codex means it's bound by a binder and has pages. Yeah. But as, as Dr. Schwartz says, when they asked Jesus to read, he opened up the scroll and it opens up horizontally and then each line is about that wide, the, the width of two fingers. And so you have, you, you have many, many, many lines. And he was able to say, uh, and he began reading the prophecy that was talking about yeah. himself, right? And it was, he would have to know his scroll, not just about, he would need to know the scrolls so well. The fun fact is all those scrolls were identical. Mm -hmm. the, the lines that were on them, the rows that were on them, were identical from one, country, from one state to another state, yeah. from one state to another city. They were all identical because they were written identically, same size, same amount of letters, same words per line. And so that's, that was a fun fact. You know, this, this leads me to, to talking about a, a, my favorite way of studying the Bible, actually, is not to, you know, move around and, and uh, pick out chapter and verse that follow on a particular topic. There's lots of value in that, don't misunderstand me. But sitting down and choosing a book of the Bible and just reading it from beginning to end. Like, you don't stop. The first time I did this was the, the uh, I sat down on a Sabbath afternoon after a light lunch. You know, you can't do it with a full stomach. No. But, <laughs> that is the lay activities. But the, the pastor said, we're going to have a Revelation seminar. And he says, I want the young people. Back in those days, believe it or not, I was young. And, and uh, he says, I want the young people to lead out. 
Revelation seminar. So I didn't know what a Revelation seminar is, but huh, let's, let me read the book of Revelation. I sat down after a light lunch, and before sundown, and it was winter, so it wasn't that long. It took me about three hours, and I read the book of Revelation from beginning to end. Wow. Amen. You know, you don't stop to think, now who is the king of the north again, and go and look that up. No, you just keep reading. Okay? And I got, folks, let me tell you, I got a completely different idea of what the Bible, and especially the book of Revelation, was all about. Amen. You know, I didn't know all the answers about what's, you know, there's so many things going on in Revelation. I didn't know all the answers. Mm -hmm. But I did know one thing, that God was in control. Mm. And that's the, that's the message behind the book of Revelation. God is in control. We might not know all the, uh, everything that's going on, everything that's being depicted. Certainly I didn't when I read it but I just keep reading. And approaching every book of the Bible like that needs, um, leads to new insights. It really does. No, I believe you're, you're, you're spot on with that. I think there's many ways you can study the Bible and reading it. I, I'm not one to read the Bible in a year from front to back. I, I have. Um, but I do read from chapter to chapter. I go slow sometimes, fast other times. Uh, but there's all kinds of reading. There's devotionals that we need to do. And devotionals are like, like you said, just a, maybe a straight reading of one chapter. Um, I want to go back just a little bit and then we'll go forward. Um, when, I, when I became a Christian, that was about 10 years ago, maybe a little more than that now, um, I had, my moral compass was really whack. It was, there was no moral compass I had. Is what, what, what was a less penalizing thing, what would cause the least amount of damage, I would do. Um, sometimes doing the right thing hurts people, though. Sometimes doing what's righteous is not always most comfortable for self. But um, I, I had to overcome many of my earthly temptations Actually, I had, to, I had to overcome all my earthly temptations by using Scripture. There, there was, there was no, I mean, prayer was definitely part of it. But God will give you Scripture to go along with your prayer. When you pray to God saying, Lord, oh, please take away my smoking habit. Lord, please get this cigarette out of my hand because I know it's killing me. And then you, you start reading the Scriptures. Amazingly enough, I'm going to tell you right now, amazingly enough, you're going to read something that is in context with your addiction or with your problem that's going to help you address it, that helps you overcome it. And so one of the greatest things I want to say that, we, that our Bible does for us actively speaking, because we're talking about living the Word of God, is giving your addictions, your temptations, your worst situations, and allowing Scripture to talk to those problems. Now, I'm not saying this is the answer all, but it is very close. If you have the Holy Spirit with you, with prayer, supplication, and reading the Scripture, there's a lot you can overcome. Uh, I can attest to that. And so I, I, when I read, I, sometimes I read straight through like you do, looking for some guidance. And when I hit it, I, I stop. And I like, like a brick wall, and I, I read past it, and I go through it again, just make sure I read it right. I'm like, yes, that's for me. That's for me today. That scripture was meant for me right now. And so we all have aha moments different ways. But um, that, that's, that, that's one of the bigger things that we got to put our bad situations along with our good situations in the scripture. Um, I wanna, we kind of covered Tuesday's lesson. I want to go to Wednesday's lesson real fast. And this is important for me because I want to cover this before we, we stop speaking today. Um, devotion time. You know, quiet time with, with, with Jesus, with God. What does that look like for each one of us? And it's going to be different. Uh, some people have a clause that they retreat to to pray. Some people set aside a few minutes in the day to pray. Um, professor here was just saying he went home, light lunch, and he dug into the Word of God, right? But a devotion, what would, what would you classify as a devotion, doctor? 
What would I classify as a devotion? Well, I think reading a few chapters of, of scripture would be, uh, would be a devotion. That's definitely a devotion. Um, you know, we have these little devotion books that take anywhere from three minutes to five minutes, I suppose, to read a, a page. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think they can be valuable. Um, I've gotten some, some insights out of that from time to time. Um, but you know, I, I think just taking some quiet time with prayer um, and asking God to lead you throughout the day, I think that can serve as a devotion too. I, I agree. It's, it's, yeah. it's time that you're going to spend, I'm, I'm going to say without distraction. I, I, I'm going to put that in there because distraction is the destruction of, uh, of creativity. But distraction is also the destruction of spirituality. So um, like we were saying earlier, like the, the kids having cell phones in their hands, if while we're talking and all of a sudden you see me pull out my cell phone while doing a Sabbath school and just start giggling away, how, how would you feel, doctor? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, good question. How would I feel? I'd, I'd feel like uh, you aren't very switched on. You're not, it isn't very important to you. And, you know, I, I, always, I always try to leave my cell phone at home. Now, I left in a rush today, and it's in my pocket, and I hope it doesn't ring <laughs> while I'm up here. But no, don't worry, I won't answer it. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it's near you're God, and I'm the person who has a devotional. You're, you're there waiting for me to teach me or to be with me. And if I'm just pull my cell phone out halfway through and start going through my text or Facebook, it's not... Yeah, it doesn't work. doesn't work. No. And so we need to put our technology aside. We need to find a quiet place. I, I like devotionals like he was speaking about. The book of devotionals, they are really inspiring. People have spent hours making those. I, I like reading out of the scripture themselves. But there's also a devotional in creationism. And I want to highlight that one because I use that one quite often. Mm -hmm. I have a garden in my backyard, a raised bed garden I built last year. And I tend to my garden, and as I'm pulling weeds, or as I'm aerating the soil, or as I'm watering the plants, I'm dwelling upon the Word of God in my head, and how He provides life for each one of us. It's like when I'm dealing with weeds that just I can't get out, I pour water on that area, and then the roots, they loosen. And I'm able to pull the weed up, not only by this little top that will regrow, but by the whole root. And so that weed will not come back. And I measure that to the Holy Spirit and sin and pulling the root of sin out of the soil of my heart. And so I, I kind of try to wrap the scriptures around my daily activities. Right now, I'm trying to rebuild a piano. And I'm looking at this whenever I'm working on a piano, I'm, I'm imagining God working on each one of us as he sands down the decayed wood or as he shines the wire that has been rusted over by age and how he desires to renew us that when we play or when we sing that we are going to glorify his name, the one who not only created us but who's trying to restore us. Mm. And so that's my, my devotion is very... What's the word you used earlier for people who are, who are very hands-on? I don't know that I used the word, I but was, there, there, there is a word for it. There, there's people that listen and learn. Uh, auditory and, and written. And uh, practical. Practical. Okay. <laughs> I have a very practical devotional. Mine's very active, and it's, it's one emotion, but it's me and God and whatever device I have in front of me, whether it's the raised garden bed or a... Uh, um, some 90-year-old piano I'm working on. And so that's, that's how I do my devotional. Mm. And it's the way God speaks with me, but each person will have their own kind of devotional, I feel. But it's important. Mm. It's important that we have our devotional daily. Not weekly, not monthly, but every day. Um, I want to read a few of these verses in, uh, 
and, and this lesson for Wednesday and Psalms. And Psalms 37, 7, it says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. And Psalms 46, 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. And Psalm 62, 1 and 2 and verse 5, it says, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Verse 5 says, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. I like that word, constant silent, silent, silent. I'm, I'm again going to pick on you as a professor because I found that this was a perfect match for Sabbath school. This, this, this morning, the Sabbath was perfect. Because I was your student, and I have this great respect for you. And in class, I wanted to be silent. But well, why is it important that the student is silent during class? Well, a student who wants to talk all the time um, isn't maybe going to learn. Um, I, okay, my, my mind just, just uh, turned to another student that, that I had this past semester, the one that was disrupted by this epidemic. Um, he wanted to talk all the time, just like this, all the time. And then if I told him, you know, stop a moment, let me talk for a while. Then he'd lay his head down and go to sleep. Ooh. And, you know, <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, this is a really hard student to reach. But so, you know, it was a small class. There was five students, as I recall. And, you know, I did find ways to, to reach him. At least he passed the course. So. Amen. <laughs> There's a time when a teacher is silent. There is a time when a teacher, when my professor, when I speak at one time in the class, and that's when the test was going on. During the test, the teacher's silent. Now, the student should also be silent. They should, but that's the one time when a teacher will not speak is during that test. He'll let you know the test is beginning. He'll let you know when the test is over. But in, in between that time, the teacher will normally sit at their desk and be praying for their students. I'm, I'm guessing that because you look like you were in prayer when we were taking our tests. <laughs> so I, I, know he was, I know he was fighting for us, even though it seemed like there was a war going on between us and the educational material. But this teacher was really working for his students. He really cares about his students, and so does God care about us. But we need to remain silent, and we need these times of silence so that God can speak to us. If when we're praying... We don't be quiet. If when we're praying or asking God for advice, if we don't give time for him to give his input, what good is praying? It's a one-way conversation, right? But we need a two-way conversation. I want to ask the doctor for advice, and the doctor will then reply to my request, hopefully with some really great life-saving advice, and I have grown stronger from that. And so it is for our devotional, it's a time for God to speak to you. Amen? And so that's, that's the importance of having devotional time. Uh, we have a lot more material, and we're not going to be able to cover this. Are there any last thoughts you have about this whole week's lesson? Well, um, you know, it's not only the end of the week, it's the end of the quarter. Yes. And, you know, we've spent this whole quarter, um, you know, the whole quarter is about how to interpret scripture. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever run into anyone in, in your Bible studies or talking to anyone who, who wants to be very literalist and mm -hmm. says, you know, why interpret it at all? Mm. Let's just listen to the Bible the way it reads. Mm -hmm. You know, can we, can we do that? Or do we have to... Do we bring our own cultural biases and our own upbringing and so on to, to Scripture? In other words, do we need to interpret? I, I think there's plenty of things interpretation assists on. I think it's needed. 
At the same time, I want to say our cultural problems we bring un undiluted. So whether we're dealing with racism, whether we're dealing with segregation, whether we're dealing with cyberbullying or whatever we might be having, we got to bring those literally undiluted. But we have, and this is Dr. Kilgore speaking through me, we need to make a homiletical bridge from the context of the day of the Bible to the context of our life now. Because what was then is not now. What is now was not then. Yeah, good. I, I think that's right on. And, you know, I think the question is, how do you take an ancient book that was written thousands of years ago? The newest part is 2,000 years old. Okay. Uh, the oldest part is much older than that, and make it relevant to your, to your life today. Um, in order to do that, you've got to interpret. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, no, we're not the only ones that struggle with this, okay? I mean, Christians are not the only ones that struggle with this. If you've heard of, of uh, Shia and Sunni Muslim and Sufi Muslims, the, the divisions within Islam are the, come going back to the same thing. Yes, okay. uh, the Jews have the Talmud, you know, how to interpret the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, what's their scriptures, how do you interpret that to the modern time? They are, everybody struggles with this. Uh, and I, I think interpretation of scripture is the reason why we have so many different denominations as well Absolutely. and why there's different understandings within the Adventist church uh, so you know in in my study this week I I looked into this a little bit um, you know how do you discover the meaning of an ancient text and somebody came up with four steps and you mentioned some of them actually you have to understand the the uh, text in its original context and meaning Okay, uh, there's lots of things in Scripture that don't seem to be don't seem to make much sense, you know. But when you understand, oh, that's how they did it, you know. Just thinking, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. At the Lord's Supper, there's this unusual, especially in the King James, this unusual phrase that John had his head in the bosom of Christ. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What, what, is he something, he's, you know, he's, he's a little bit strange? No, it isn't about that. It's that they sat on a low table, sat reclined around a low table yep. with their head and arms near the table, and it just means that he was beside Christ, and his head was sort of, Jesus was reclining one side, and he was reclining the other, so his head was right here, you know? He wasn't laying down on Christ's lap, okay? No, no. So, but, you know, there's, there's things like that that need to be understood. So the first thing is then, you understand the text in its original meaning and context. You've got to know a lot of history and archaeology to be able to do that. The second step is, you understand the gap between the ancient situation and our situation now. And when you understand the gap, then you could think about, this is the third step, then you can think about how to bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. How to bridge the gap. The fourth one is the one that we talk about the least, I think, and that's applying the theological principle to our daily lives. Amen. You know, this week's lesson is living by the Word of God. How do we make it relevant to our life today? What does it actually mean to live by the word of God? I want to use one word because I had that same question in my head. Okay. No, just one word. Surrender. That's the word I had. When I asked myself that same question, even this morning, I'm like, what does it mean to live the word of God? Yeah. And I have to surrender everything, right? Mm. Well, we are... We are overdue. We're overdue. We are. Okay. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and can you close that in a word of prayer? All right. Father, we thank you so very much for this 
all quarter long we've talked about how to interpret your word. The, the ancient texts are the way that you reached people so long ago and we need to work a little bit to apply them to our lives today. We thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to do that, to struggle with that, to encourage each other with that, to, to uh, uh, supply our own experiences, to share our own experiences with others so that others may, may be able to do that as well. We ask for your presence here as we continue our worship of you in your name. Amen. Amen. Please stay tuned. And if you need a copy of next week's quarterly, please just contact the church and we'll bring it out to you or you can come by and get one from our office. God bless each one of you. See you in a few moments. So we, we spoke to uh, some of the leaders in the municipalities, the mayors and these things, uh, and sort of representatives. And we asked them, what are the real needs in the community? And one area that really stuck out as a major uh, need was, uh, was loneliness. In Sortland, Norway, loneliness is a key challenge among both the elderly and the young. About one third of the teenagers here say they feel lonely. So this is why we, we started thinking, well, what can we as a church do to, uh, to contribute and meet that need? Uh, we're trying and failing uh, and uh, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and through that uh, learning. They d don't necessarily know the, the name of God and who He is, but a lot of people do believe there is a God. Um, and so belief in God is quite typical at the same time as traditional church is seen as problematic in regard to the core cultural values. This region was one of the key areas for Adventism in Norway. Uh, we had areas here with the highest density of Adventists in, uh, in all of Norway. And now our churches are very much dying. Similar to many places around the world, the church has lost its foothold, struggling to be known as an integral part of the community. Can the church still be relevant here in Sortland? Pastor Kenneth believes so. The key is forming connections where people are and meeting their most painful needs. The family structures uh, uh, is sort of something also this under attack uh, in this region. Uh, so a lot of unstable family relationships. So we had a family retreat recently. We wanted to place a focus upon families spending time together. Uh, so that was the overall goal, um, strengthening family bonds. Over the six days of the retreat, the eight families focused on spending wholesome time together. Organized activities like crafts and games provided opportunities for bonding and a lot of laughter and smiles. It was very positive. It was very encouraging. They were so grateful because these families were also families that couldn't afford uh, vacation themselves. So this was part of it. Also, we were offering them a vacation experience and uh, they were just so grateful for, for that experience. And uh, friendships uh, building over that week we had spent together was, uh, so it was a very encouraging time. It has been sort of uh, quite touching also seeing how God has been opening doors that we did not expect. When they see uh, we as a church really wanting the best for the community, um, so they've given access where we can sort of be quite, quite bold and open about faith uh, and, and it's received quite well as well. So I think uh, this is not something we've been doing, but, but it's uh, seeing how God is working on the lives of people and the hearts of people and opening doors that seemed very closed. 
Please pray for church members in Sortland, Norway. Pray that God uses them to overcome the challenges of loneliness, broken families, and skepticism in the community, and that through this, people can come to know Jesus personally. This quarter, a portion of your 13th Sabbath offering will help build a center of influence for Pastor Kenneth and the church members to host programs and events geared toward the community. The offering will also help construct an urban center of influence in Cyprus and establish a church in Serbia. Please consider how you can support these projects through prayer and by giving to this offering. Good morning, church. How are you this Sabbath? Good, good, good. We'll get started in a little bit, but I wanted to just greet you and welcome you. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, and hello to those tuning in and watching, and also happy Sabbath to those who are here in the sanctuary at Cleveland First Seventh-day Adventist Church. We want to welcome everyone who is here, and there are some also coming in, and those who are watching on this uh, high Sabbath, on this high day, because it's the Sabbath day. And so... Uh, just a couple of announcements before we continue with uh, our song service. I just wanted to, uh, for, to ask you to keep in our prayers, uh, if you have a bulletin or if you saw the announcements uh, also in your emails, to keep the battles uh, of family in your prayers. Uh, Bob Battles passed away this week and they are having a, a private um, service. And also Joyce Wolf passed away uh, this week. And so let's keep the family in our prayers uh, for, for uh, a Joyce Wolf. There is a, a cemetery uh, service uh, Friday the 3rd of July, the, the 3rd of July at 2 p.m. at Rose Hill Cemetery for those that would like to accompany the family. Um, apart from that, Today we finished a, qu a good quarter um, of Sabbath school, and I want to thank uh, those, everyone who's been helping and participating up here uh, with these quarterlies and going over them. And uh, thank you so much uh, for 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 those vol volunteers. We do, we are starting a new quarter today, making friends for God. Amen, amen. The joy of sharing in His mission. And friends, that's what we are all about. That is why we exist. Uh, to make friends for God and sharing in His, in his, 
in his mission. And so if you do not have your quarterly yet, there are in the back table both large print and regular print, and you can uh, pick yours up. And for those watching, you can come by during the church office from 8 to noon uh, here Monday through Friday and pick it up. And if you like it delivered, just let us know, and we'll be happy to take it to you as well. I also want to just emphasize that Vacation Bible School will be happening July 20th to the 24th. Amen. And so uh, it's, in, it's in the bulletin there. You can, you can register your kids from ages 4 to 11 at cleburnvbs.weebly.com. And, and so for those watching, the announcement as well has been posted. And so July 20th to the 24th from 6 to 8.30. And so we look forward to serving and teaching our kids about God, about Jesus. And again, just uh, also want to uh, continue to remind everyone that CACS registration continues to be open as well. And so there, the information in your bulletin, the phone number of the school or the website, uh, if you would like more information about registration. Happy Sabbath, church. Welcome to the house of God. And for those watching, we want to welcome you also and so at this time, I'm going to invite Sharon, and she can lead us out in, a, in some songs. And, and so let's sing uh, with joy, praises to our God. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Let's turn in our hymnals to hymn number 341. 341. If you're worshiping from your home, then... It's called To God Be the Glory, and please sing along with us.
let's go back just a little bit to number 216. Hymn number 216, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen. of us to make that pact every day that when the roll is called we will all be there now let's go back to hymn number 12 joyful joyful we adore thee
Amen. It sounded lovely hearing everyone sing. So let's keep singing nice and loud to make jealous those who are watching. No. But praise the Lord. Hope you were singing at home too uh, with, with us. As now I want to focus our attention to the, to the Garden of Prayer, the time where we spend time in prayer, where we thank God for our many blessings, where we also ask Him for any petitions, requests that we may have. I want to just share with you uh, or read a very familiar hymn that you are familiar with, Hymn 287. We sang it last night as we were receiving the Sabbath, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. And every time Jesus calls, it is softly and tenderly. Now sometimes he shakes us or breaks us, but he is still calling softly and tenderly. Calling for you and for me. At the heart's portal, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. You see, God is always going to be inviting us. Always. Always. He never comes or goes where he is not invited. And so he's calling, he's, he's watching, waiting for our response. And what is, what, is, what is the appeal? Come home. Come home. You who are weary, weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. And then it says, calling all what? You see, Jesus doesn't cover up what we are. He doesn't say, you know, come after you fix yourself, then come home. Come home. You sinners, come home. Come home. And that is, 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 is what the church should also be. If there is, if there is, if, you know, if there is anything that, that, that I am thankful for, I'm thankful for many things. Uh, one of those things is, is, is for the mother that, that God uh, lent me, that God gave to me, to my, to my sister and I. And I know that I'm not the only one. But I know, my sister and I, my sister and I know that no matter what we did, no matter how bad maybe we were, or what thing we messed up, or maybe how we might have embarrassed her, we always have a place in her home. She will always say, come home. Come home, no matter what. No matter what people may say about you, no matter what you've done. And if that's how we do as parents, imagine God, our Father, who loves us much more than we love our own children. So I just want to invite you this morning as we come to the Garden of Prayer, as we kneel to the, to the Garden of Prayer. We're not going to come to the front. We're just kneel, if you're able to kneel, to kneel where you are. And we are going to, to come home to God, for He wants to hear from us. He is happy to hear from us. And just happy to know that we come home to Him. So, so let's, uh, if you're able to kneel, let's kneel or uh, bow your heads as we come to the Garden of Prayer.
Lord, our Father, we come to you today, Lord, surrendering our heart to you, bowing down before your, your glory. Lord, we ask that you pass over each one of us who are here in this sanctuary, those who are listening today. Lord, look at our hearts. Read it, Lord. As we put forward the petitions that we have, the aches and the pains that stir within it, Lord, we ask that you address these. We ask that you address them in the best way possible, not for, not for our own benefit, Lord, but that we might find salvation at the end of your decision. Lord, comfort us in the pains that we exist in. And the troubles that we have in this day, in this world, Lord, give us comfort. Allow us to know you are still in control, that nothing is escaping your perception. That our very moments and our very thoughts and our very prayers are the center of your attention. And that you are focused on us. And now, and even now, you're still knocking upon the hearts of each one of us here and those listening that we might open the door and let you in, that you might dine with us, that you might dwell with us, and that you might stay with us. Lord, be with our family members who we're praying for as well, our sons and our daughters who are in trouble, our parents and our brothers and sisters, Lord, who are in need. We pray for those who are sick, either with some sickness or the one that's so popular in the world today. Lord, lay your healing hands upon those who need it. Comfort those who are comforting those who are sick. Be with our first responders, Lord. Be with our doctors, our nurses, our caretakers. Be with our teachers, Lord, and our physicians. Lord, we thank you that you will strengthen us. We thank you. Where our impossibility begins, your possibility starts. We thank you that you're always with us. And we ask, Lord, that you remain with us. Again, Lord, pass over our hearts and comfort us. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So today's scripture reading is found in John 17, verse 21. John 17, verse 21. Clarissa will be reading from the International Children's Bible. Father, I pray that all people who believe in me can be one. You are in me, and I am in you. I pray that these people can also be one in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. Amen. 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 If you keep your fingers there in John 17. This morning we're going to talk about unity and diversity. And I know that you know the 
God loves you very much. God is gracious to us. I'm not here to remind you of that. We are going to participate in that. We're here on this Sabbath asking that, that God really touch our hearts, but more than touch our hearts, he breaks our hearts. He, he breaks us. I need to be broken, as well as every single one of you, and all those who are watching as well. And so I just want to begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, may we hear your spirit, and may we humble ourselves, our stubborn selves, to your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays for his disciples, and he prays for us. It's Jesus' last prayer there in John 17, verse 11. If you have your Bibles, open them there to John 17, verse 11. Here Jesus is praying. He says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And then let's jump to verse 20. And then he prays for us. He says in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. Is that us? Yes, it is. Verse 21 that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you send me. Verse 22, And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. So as we are here on this communion Sabbath. What does this prayer have to do with the Lord's Supper? Well, when you read the context, it has everything to do with it. Jesus' last prayer is during the Lord's Supper. It is right before they head out and go to Gethsemane. And so in the context here, the Lord, Jesus began there. You can read the context. It begins from John chapter 13. In John 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet because nobody wants to wash their feet. And the, the, the disciples, well, of course, in their minds, prideful. Even after they see Jesus wash one or two, no one steps up and says, Okay, okay, Lord, I will continue. Jesus continued washing everyone's feet disciples feet all of the disciples feet in John 14 Jesus predicts Peter's denial this is this this is all happening while they're in the upper room there in John 15 Jesus warns them that the world is going to hate them because they hate him in John 16 he talks about the work of the Holy Spirit and so there are many things here in context of what Jesus is dealing with at the Lord's Supper. And then just turn with me there to Luke chapter 22. Go to the book of Luke. And if you mark Luke chapter 22, during the Lord's Supper, during communion, while Jesus is instituting this and, and, and Jesus washes their feet, nobody wants to wash their feet, Jesus predicts Peter's denial, but then he says, It's okay, Peter, you believe in me. I, I'm preparing a place for you. We know those verses in John 14, 1 through, through 3. Jesus warns them how they're going to hate them because they hate him. And then in Luke 22, verse 24, the Bible says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the what? The greatest. This is all happening in the upper room. 
while the Lord is, while they are in this uh, service, in this ceremony, at the Lord's Supper, Jesus is dealing with his betrayer. If you remember, he has said, you know, Jesus says that the one who is going to betray him is here. And they're all asking, is it me? Is it me? So he's dealing with knowing that Judas is going to betray him. He's dealing knowing that Peter is going to deny him in a couple of hours. He's dealing with his disciples bringing their own agenda to the Lord's Supper. Bringing their own positions. Who's the greatest? No, I am. No, no, I am. But what's the whole purpose of this service that we have right here? It's the opposite of all that, isn't it? And even, and, even, and even worse, Jesus dealing with also that just in a couple of hours after Gethsemane, as it, as it says in Matthew 26, 56, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. They came to the Lord's Supper to communion with unholy ambition. You can see it there in the context from John 13 and onward and, and other gospel writers. Each came with pride. One came with a betrayal, be, betrayal heart. Others came with wanting position. Who's going to be first? No, I am. So I want to ask you this morning, how did you come today? How did you come today to this service, to this upper room experience? Or those who are watching, how did you tune in? Are you tuning in? Maybe while you're preparing lunch, but you're just tuning in because you want to watch the church service? Are you tuning in maybe while you're seeing the latest news and see how many more restrictions are going to be put? Are you tuned in 100% to what this represents? I want you to ask yourselves, how did you come to this service? Do you understand, maybe a little bit, can, can we understand why Jesus' last prayer request was what? That his disciples just get along and be one. And not just his disciples, even looking into the future in us today, that his church also may be one. He knew that they all had, that, that they were all prideful. He knows that they all wanted position. He knows that his betrayer was there. He knew that Peter was going to deny him, that they were all going to forsake him. And because of this, what is Jesus' burden in his heart? His burden in his heart is what? Unity. That's his burden. Unity. His burden in his heart wasn't that I hope my disciples or my future disciples keep the Sabbaths better. No. His burden wasn't in his heart that, 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 that I, I hope that they're more faithful in their tithes or in their, or in their offerings. His burden in his heart wasn't that, that, that they eat more tofu or veggie burgers. His burden in his heart wasn't the dress code. And, oh, you need a, that, that's too short. You're, you're not wearing a sleeve. You're not wearing a, a tie. Those things, friends, were not his burden in this prayer. Jesus had one burden. When Jesus prays for his church, he is praying for oneness, for unity. If we just become one, if we just become one, all these other things will take care of themselves. Not just one in our church, but one in our conference, one in the North American division. For Christ's sake, I cannot speak for any other divisions because I don't know. But the North American division is a divided division. And this prayer is so appropriate for us who live and practice in this division. God is praying for unity. God is praying that we get along. You see, there's one thing that the church, the one thing that, that, that makes the church one 
is our understanding that without the grace of God, we have no hope. We have no chance. What makes us one is that we all recognize we are all sinners needing salvation and redemption by Christ. Now, praise the Lord. Amen. And we say amen. But when I recognize, when I say to myself, who am I that God should have mercy on me? I'm nobody. Oh, well, well, well you're the pastor. Well, you, you, graduated, you graduated from Southwestern. You are the, the grandson of a pastor who did. That means nothing. You and I, friends, when I, when I recognize, who am I that God should be gracious to you? And I appreciate that even though I am nobody, he is still gracious to me and forgives me and cleanses me with his blood. Then it's easier for me to be gracious unto you because you and I are in the same level, are in the same boat, needing, needing God's grace. It means nothing how many years you have served in the church. It means nothing how long you have served in the church, whether you're an elder, a deacon, a deacon, it's a Sabbath school, a musician. It means nothing how many degrees we may have. It means nothing if, if, if I volunteer all my hours in the Hope Clinic or in the school. All of these things mean nothing, listen to me carefully, if I am not talking to one of my fellow church members. Amen. All these things, all these good things that I do mean nothing if I am not speaking to somebody else at church. It means nothing if I am prejudiced or racist toward anyone. God wants us to be one. That's why in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Turn your Bible is there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. All of these works are good works, friends, but let's not pretend that that's enough and that we have it made because we do good deeds to the community or to our school or to, or to the ministries. If we are not speaking to each other, if we go around somebody because, oh, that person just drives me crazy, friends, we haven't reached Christianity 101. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Here Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And before we continue, just that verse 44. Just verse 44. It's a difficult verse to swallow. Even much more to practice. Think about it, friends. But I say to you, love your enemies. I don't think I personally have any enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. There are some people who dislike me, and I need to do good to them. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, in the context, is Jesus asking us to pray for them that they may get punished by God? No. To pray for them that God bless them, that God watch over them, that God continues to, to bless them as well. Notice verse, verse 45. When we love our enemies, when we pray for those who persecute us or talk bad about us, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. Hmm. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and, the, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Friends, verse 40, 45 lets us know that just because some people are having blessings, and the, or you may be receiving a blessing. It doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus is happy with me or happy with you. Because right here, he blesses, sends rain and sun to the good and to who else? And to the evil one. 
So because somebody is, in, is prospering in prosperity, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that their heart may be right with God. They may, they may be practicing evil, but God still blesses the good and the bad. Verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do even the tax collectors, do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. In just verses 43 to 48, we have an idea. It's not this, this morning's message. God does want us to be perfect. The world has a definition of perfect. The Bible is giving us a definition of perfect here. Love those who, who aren't lo lovable. And I want to read it, and this is not going to be on the screen. I just decided to, at the last minute, to read it from the Good News Bible, just plain, easy English, these same verses. So just bear with me here from Matthew 5, 43 through 48, from the Good News Bible. You have heard that it was said, love your friends, hate your enemies. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may become the children of your Father in heaven, that he makes his son to shine on bad and good people alike and gives rain to those who do good and to those who do evil. Why should God reward you if you love only the people who love you? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you speak only to your friends, have you done anything out of the ordinary? Even the pagans do that. You must be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You see, friends, we may do a lot of good deeds, but if there is somebody we dislike, or somebody we despise, or maybe not even a person, it can be a race or a culture, and you refuse, and we refuse to let God change that heart in us, we refuse and want to stay despising people or particular person. Friends, all our good deeds and everything, we can take all that with us when we go in the lake of fire. Because there is no room in heaven, there is no room in heaven for that type of heart. Amen. If you only care about those as it says here, if we only care about those who are nice to us, Jesus is saying, you know, I mean, even the bad people do that. What's so special about you? On the contrary, but if you love those and are kind to those who are not kind to you, that's different. That's different. If, you, if we only care and are nice to those who are nice to us, we're barely Christians. I would go as far as to say we're not. God tells us to love those who talk bad about you. God tells us to love those who are racist or prejudiced toward us or toward you. There is already, friends, there is already too much segregation in this world right now. Too much. And the church should not be part of it. Amen. Because we are all called, and Jesus' last prayer and pleading before he goes to the cross is that his disciples, just get along. Just be one. Just be one. Just how you and I, Father, are one. Have them that they may be one and may be one in us. There is no room for segregation in the church, and there is no room for that in a heart, in a heart of a Christian. We are to be one. One. The greatest proof that God's grace is in a church is that the people are gracious. That's the proof. The evidence that you or I are growing in grace is that we are gracious to others. And this includes, friends, everywhere we are, everywhere we go. 
You know, it's sometimes embarrassing when young people, you know, we can't fool anyone, and we can't fool God, of course. But it's, it's, it's sometimes sad when, when we are gracious to each other here, but once we leave these doors, we eat each other, whether through the di diff different ways. One of the most common ways that people talk about or dislike each other and, and are just mean and, is through social media. You see, you, we, I am sometimes embarrassed when our young people from our church talk to me and say, you know, oh, I didn't know that such and such person didn't like such and such person. I said, well, they don't. Well, look at what they put on Facebook. They bash somebody else because they, they, they may have a different political view. They bash and, and talk bad about somebody else because they may have a different view of, of, of COVID-19 or whatever the topic may be, friends. We need to quit playing around. Amen. So Facebook isn't a stream to air out. On the contrary, it's, it's more of a coward way. The, the, what does the Bible say? If you have an, in, an issue with somebody, go to that person and say, Brother, you know, I need to talk to you. I took offense about this or that in private. We need to be one, not just in here, but everywhere we go, in the groceries, on Facebook, on Instagram, whatever social media is, on the telephone, everywhere we go, at home. It is amazing how God labors with his church, friends. He loves, and he loves us and is patient with us day and day after day after day. Amen. And because, in all fairness, we, you and I, are stiff-necked and stubborn. We are. We are stiff-necked and we are stubborn. I do not want to remind you of God's grace, but I want to remind you of how sometimes we can be ungracious to each other and maybe even those out of the faith. It's discouraging sometimes, with, even within the church, when we talk about our own people, Avenue, Seventh-day Avenue, oh, where's he from? Oh, oh, California? Oh, well, what do you expect? That's California. There are brothers and sisters in Christ as well, friends. Amen? It doesn't matter what part of the world. God wants us to be united, unity in diversity. And the only way that that can happen, friends, the only way it is if we are one with God. That's the only way. If God reigns in our hearts and God controls our thoughts and controls our tongues and controls our texting and controls every part that we do not take a step without asking, Lord, is this what you want me to say? Is this what you want me to text? Is this where you want me to go? Is this how you want me to treat the person that you gave and died for also? And we really pause about that. Then we let the Holy Spirit maybe change what we were going to say or do or go. The only way that we can be one is when we become one with God. For instance, that can happen today as we partake in this service right here. When Jesus instituted this breaking of the bread and drinking of the juice, he was dealing with disciples who were prideful, selfish, prejudiced. One was going to deny him. He, he was dealing with people like you and I. Amen. And yet he still invites us. Come home. Partake in this. And he is praying to his father, Lord, my God, let them be one. And Jesus still is making that prayer, that, that prayer request today. That prayer request today. Jesus prayed that his disciples be one at the Lord's Supper. And when we partake in this service, let us surrender, friends. I invite you. I can only invite you. Let us surrender any prejudice, any dislike, any despisement we may have toward anyone, toward anyone, friends. 
We are all guilty, myself and all of us. And let us open our heart to the Holy Spirit. Let us open our heart to God. As we partake in this, we be, it is an opportunity to become one with God, but also one with our brothers and sisters. And those who, may be, those who are watching, as we, are, as we also partake, as you are listening, you can also, you can also, with, with the help of God, all of us, those who are watching and those who are here, become one. Put away any dislike. On the contrary, if somebody likes tacos and you don't like tacos, well, we love each other anyway. Whatever dislike or whatever, you like that music, I don't like this music, it doesn't matter. I love you because God loves you. You like to wear this, oh, but I don't like how that looks. It doesn't matter. I love you because God loves you. Under, under, under this bread and this, this juice, which represents the blood and the body of Christ, God gave his life for all of, of us. To be one. And until we are one, the church will, be, will, will do powerful things. Meanwhile, is, we're just going to be maintaining the church. But until we become really one, friends, then the church will make a difference. Then we can make a difference in Cleburne. Then we can make a difference in Texas. And then we can make a difference in the North American division. So let's, let's bow our heads as we prepare to partake and participate in this service. Father in heaven, Lord, forgive me, for you know my heart. You know at times where maybe I have looked at somebody or at particular people and maybe tried to avoid them or dislike them. Lord, you loved them and died for them just how you loved me and died for me. And forgive us as your church, if we have done that to anyone. Lord, let the world see, although the world may want to segregate in different groups or races or cultures, let them see that your children here want to be united with everyone, but primarily with you. That we may be one, because there is one Lord one spirit, one faith, and one baptism. And so, Father in heaven, as we partake in this service, we, I just ask that your Holy Spirit abide and break away anything that needs to be broken and taken away through your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for hearing my prayer and for answering according to your divine will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. At this time... We will partake in the foot washing, which will be in the Family Life Center. There are three sections divided there for married couples, for ladies, and for men. Uh, the water uh, has... Um, it's sanitized, thank you. It, 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 it's clean. Uh, it's been disinfected. Uh, um, but still, we are still practicing safety and cleanliness. There is hand sanitizer there as well. And the deacons will wear the necessary items to make sure that all of us um, are not at any risk. And so at this time, let's, uh, for those who want to participate, let's go over to the Family Life Center. And then we'll come back.
in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, the Bible says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord which on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At this time, we're going to have a prayer for the bread. And if you're able to kneel, I invite you to kneel. If not, you can just bow your heads as we uh, thank God for the, the sacrifice of his broken body for us. So at this time, let's uh, kneel. Father in heaven, thank you very much for the gift of life. And we have the gift of life when we are born, but what greater gift of eternal life because of your sacrifice. Your sacrifice of giving your son, the sacrifice of Jesus giving himself Thank you for that broken body that he let himself. It wasn't taken from him, but he willfully gave his body for me and for all of us. Thank you, Lord, for that great sacrifice. Thank you for loving us so much. What more can we say than thank you, but also to share with others that this broken body was broken for everyone. And thank you for that grace. We thank you and we want to honor you and we want to please you in everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. the deacons pass the bread we will sing him 312 near the cross 312 
I just want to make sure that everyone has a piece of bread. Okay. The Bible, the, the Bible says there in Matthew 26, 26, continuing, where it says, And they took, and, and as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So let's partake at this time. Again, the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Um, as far as we possibly can. Let's uh, kneel as we pray for the, the blood and the wine emblem. Lord our Father, how much you love the world that you sent your only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But, Lord, that life is in the blood. The remission of sins is through blood. The blood of oxen, the blood of a sheep, the blood of rams, and the blood of bulls is not sufficient to pay for the sin of humanity. Only your blood, Lord, was enough to pay the price for our sins. And Lord, you had to come to earth. You had to live amongst us. You had to live a life that was perfect and a world full of sin. Blameless, Lord, you went to the cross. Blameless, Lord, you gave us your blood. That our sins might be blotted out as once were a scholar are now as white as wool. So, Lord, we thank you for this precious, priceless gift of your blood, that you have done it for each one of us individually, that if we petition, Lord, in our hearts for the remission, for the forgiveness of sins, you are faithful to forgive us. For while we were yet still sinners, Lord, you died for us. While we were still yet sinners, you loved us. And while we were yet still sinners, Lord, you walked one step in front of the other into Calvary to seal, to lead captivity captive, 
to take away the sting, that we might have life everlasting with you. So Lord, we claim this emblem of, of juice, of new wine, as a sign of your blood to us. And may we do this, Lord, and may we remember you in all the times that we do it. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And as we partake of these emblems, let us rejoice and sing in sing hymn 184, Jesus Paid It All.
In Matthew chapter 26, verse 27, the Word of God says, Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. May the God add a blessing to this word. You may not feel any different, but there is a big difference. There is a big, big difference because of the life of Jesus, what he did for you and for me. And just how Jesus, God, wants us to be one. You know, every time Jesus compares, you read about Jesus and his church, it is always in the example of a marriage. The bride is coming. We are the bride. The groom is coming. We should be preparing ourselves. And whenever, and when Jesus instituted the marriage, what did he say there in Genesis? Father, that they should be father and mother, and they should become one. And by God's grace and by God's mercy, not by anything we are, anything we have accomplished, because it is all by the mercies of God that we have become one with Christ, and we surrender our hearts to him today. God bless you. May you have a happy Sabbath. We're going to sing our closing hymn, and so I invite you to, to stand with us as we sing our closing hymn 343, which is entitled, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. And so let us do that. Let us sing of our Redeemer, 343.
bow our heads. Father in heaven, praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you so very much. Because of this redemption and help us to not just only sing it today, but sing it every day and sing it to others and let others know that you have redeemed the whole world, but it takes our hearts to surrender it to you to really appreciate and enjoy the fullness of that redemption. So thank you, Lord, for the work you have done. And I ask that you be with your church, not just here in Cleburne, but your church in Texas, your church all around the world. And may we all draw closer to you. And as we draw closer to you, closer to each other, in unity and in love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May God bless you. Ushers will dismiss you.